welcome to another episode of Unauthorized Disclosure. I am one of your hosts, Rania Kalik, and I'm joined by the show's other host, Kevin Gastola. Hello, Kevin. Hey. Um, so I am still in Lebanon. Kevin is in Chicago, I think. Yep. Yeah. And we have a really cool guest on the show who I don't think we've had him on the show for like two years or something. Uh, lots changed since then. Um, so just uh, welcoming on the show, Max Blumenthal. Thank you, Max, for, for being good, on with us. Good to be on with you. Uh, it's been a while. It more has pe- been. <clears throat> more people hate us since then. <laughs> That's so true. That's true. We've definitely gained more enemies and created new ones. <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> for sure. <laughs> Well, so we have a lot to talk about. Um, As we say, but... it pass over uh, next year and next year in our Twitter notifications. <laughs> if, if, we, if we have any Twitter notifications left, I feel like I'm going to get kicked off soon. Um, but yeah, no, so we have like a lot to talk about. Uh, you know, actually, Max, one reason that we didn't invite you on is because, well, first of all, you know, you're a friend and we really like you and stuff. But also we've been getting requests to have you on. So not as many people hate you. As you might think, um, so you're really popular. No, there, there's a and... silent, there's a silent majority that likes us. <laughs> they're silent. They're too scared to speak out. <laughs> I, yeah. I'm assuming. Awesome. But I, I mean, the the we, you and I have been getting into a lot of shit lately because of the serious stuff, um, which is why people wanted us to have you on. Because uh, I mean, that's kind of we've been getting crucified in in recent like months. I would I wouldn't go that far. I mean, you know, I think that. The uh, the small little kind of disproportionately loud group of people that makes a lot of noise in support of regime change and sort of is dedicated to fracturing left wing circles is more marginal than we think. And um, I mean, I've actually been approached in public by people I sort of peripherally know who are like, you know, a lot of them are local activists in D.C. and they focus on local issues and they they were just you know, very, very enthusiastic about the work we've been doing. Um, and they find it enlightening and they've been, uh, sort of turned away from the conventional narrative, which is that, you know, we should topple another Middle Eastern government. So I really don't, I don't want to go as far as saying we've been crucified. I think that's a little bit hyperbolic, but well, anyway. I mean, you know, you're, you're totally right. I agree with you in that respect. And I, yeah, I do want to point out to you, like I, people, when they do hear me either talk on Syria or when they've been watching what's been going on, um, they do approach me and say either thanks or, Oh, I didn't know. Like I had no idea what it was even about. Um, and there's also a lot of people who are just freaked out. And that's what I find interesting is they're scared to really even say anything because of the insane amount of, uh, vitriol that gets sent your way if you do talk about Syria in a way that challenges the mainstream narrative. And so I actually want to bring it to, like, let's get straight into it, because we talk about this a lot on the show. So anyone who's listening already, you know, has a somewhat, should have somewhat of an understanding of, like, what's happening in Syria. So let's talk about the left, because I think that's one of the most um, sort of interesting aspects and almost fascinating aspects of all of this is the way that not only has the left been fractured on Syria, but like the establishment left, if you will, the gatekeepers of the left um, have basically made it impossible to really present a narrative that challenges what you see in any other like in The New York Times or the State Department. Like what yeah. what's your take on that? Why is why is democracy now coverage of Syria so bad? Oh, well, let me let, I mean, let's just kind of unpack it, starting with the issue of the left. Um, I always was. um kind of, I wouldn't say skeptical, but sort of, I, I was I was shy to kind of present myself as a person of the left or a spokesman for the left. And that's what I think the people speaking from the other side on Syria have done, is they've presented themselves as gatekeepers of the left, and here's what's acceptable, and here's what the left must do. And, you know, what's frustrated me a lot <clears throat> is just when you look at who they are, and politically, a lot of them just aren't leftists. Um, like, um, I, 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 there's the, I don't know, you might be too young to remember Jeff Foxworthy, he's this comedian, and he'd say, you know, you might be a redneck, he's from the 90s, you might be a redneck if you measure your status by how many dogs you have under your porch, you know, and it's kind (laughs) of like, you might not be a, you might not be a leftist 
if you defend Wahhabism while constantly attacking the left. And that's what a lot of these people... <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there okay. needs to be like a left-wing Jeff Foxworthy because, I mean, you see that constantly. I remember you criticized Wahhabism on Twitter, which is sort of the state re religion of Saudi Arabia, <clears throat> um, you know, which is responsible for the pronouncements of the former chief mufti bin Baz that forbid even the display of women's hands. Um, to be fair, to be fair, women's hands are very, are very scary. I, I, I have I, them, so I understand. I, I Anyways, mean, uh, I, I, I tend, I tend to, I'm, 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 you know, I'm not like, you know, a, a Hezbollah member, but I tend to agree with uh, increasingly with Hassan Nasrallah that um, Wahhabism has had a more toxic effect on the Middle East than even Zionism. But that's yeah. a controversial opinion in certain circles, and you have these writers, these kind of, they're, they're like millennials who uh, <laughs> write at Middle East Eye and Mufta and these kind of places, um, these, you know, I don't know who reads them, and all they do is attack the left and whitewash not only, you know, Salafi jihadist rebels in Syria, but Wahhabism itself, the ideology itself. And so, you know, you might not be a leftist if you're doing that. <laughs> then, you have, then you have the ISO. Um, you know, and I've got a lot of friends in that organization. I, I spoke at the. They still talk to you? Uh, well, uh, yeah, there, there, there's, <laughs> some good, there's some good people in there. I mean, I don't know. The, the Syria thing is, is their, their position on it. It's definitely interesting. I mean, they're Trotskyists. They believe in permanent revolution. And so they tend to kind of whenever there's a, a chance for regime change, they tend to favor it and, you know, Note, well, it's, it's kind of depends kind on which of, regime. Yeah, it depends on which which regime. But you know, it's notable that many of the neocons emerge from Trotskyist circles with that same mentality. Um, mm -hmm. The ISO is the International Socialist Organization. Um, some of my friends uh, in the PSL, um, you know, they call it um, the Imperial Support Organization because of the <laughs> they've taken on Syria and they've been very influential in splitting left-wing circles. I was just listening to uh, Max Isle, <clears throat> who's someone um, who I've always, I, uh, I, I really, um, you know, look to as kind of a guide on the Syria issue. He's done a lot mm -hmm. of research. He's a PhD student at Cornell. Um, he's in Tunisia now working on his research. And he was on Justin Pod Podor's broadcast, uh, his podcast. And Max made a really interesting and disturbing point, which is that divestment resolutions um, within Students for Justice in Palestine circles have gone down by a factor of 10 in the past year. I've actually noticed um, a perceptible wow. shift in how many, how much fewer divestment resolutions are taking place. Um, I used to, you know, be kind of parachuted into some of these um, hearings as a speaker to talk about what was happening in Palestine and why divestment was necessary. And this kind of phenomenon doesn't take place anymore. He pointed the finger at um, elements within Palestine circles that are dedicated to regime change in Syria and which, which are actively um, fracturing um, what you could call the movement. Uh, and he spoke about his own experience leading the um, SJP chapter at Cornell and how they came under attack over the issue of Yarmouk, the Palestinian refugee camp outside Damascus, by elements from SJP in Chicago, which are still actively campaigning for regime change in Syria and really putting it at the front of their agenda. And, and you know, the fact is, within the Palestinian diaspora, there's just no consensus on Syria. And then, obviously, there's no consensus within the left. So if you make the criteria for being a good leftist or someone who can be in solidarity with Palestinians, that you also have to be in solidarity with, and they always say the Syrian people, but of course they're talking about, you know, the people who they're control. They're talking about the, like the opposition areas, yeah. Yeah, they're never yeah, talking like, about actual Syrians. Like the, uh, you know, <laughs> the, woke, the woke Wahhabi dudes from um, Hayat Tahrir al-Sham, which is basically rebranded al-Qaeda. Yeah, let's just, we'll just pretend that, that they're all actually Syrian and not like at least a significant portion of them are foreigners, and let's be yeah, in solidarity foreign, with them. Foreign <laughs> fighters, I mean, this is, uh, you know, clearly, you know, Assad is making these guys come from like Molenbeek well, so, in London to do this. No, that's, that's what's crazy. He created, so, like, a he couple... created them. <laughs> 
<laughs> he created ISIS, right? Well, that's the crazy thing. So like a couple days ago, Anand Gopal, who's someone we've had on the show before, someone I know personally and I like Anand, I really, I respect his work on Afghanistan and, and he's done some good work in like the Middle Eastern region covering wars, but he goes on Democracy Now! a couple days ago. Also, Anand is also in the ISO. He's an ISO guy. So that's a lot of his ideology on this, I think. I mean, it's very in keeping with the ISO's take on Syria. But he goes on Democracy Now! and he says not only has the U.S. not supported regime change in Syria, which is an absurd statement, but let's pretend they're not. Fine, let's pretend the U.S. is spending billions of dollars a year you know, arming rebels and, you know, spending decades trying to weaken the Syrian government and finally getting the chance to. Let's pretend that they weren't actively supporting regime change. Even if that were the case, Anand goes further to say that Syrians are joining ISIS because Assad is so brutal. That is the most absurd statement I've ever heard um, for a number of reasons. Because, like, you could you could make the argument that maybe some Syrians joined opposition, armed opposition groups because of the because of the government. Like, you couldn't. That's debatable. But you can totally make that argument, and that could have some truth to it, right? That they joined some opposition groups. But ISIS, like ISIS, first of all, a good chunk of them come from literally like 80 or 100 different countries around the world. Um, so I'm pretty sure that like a bunch of middle class people from Europe didn't go join ISIS because Assad's so brutal. That's absurd. But what's your take on that? Like the fact that he goes on and Chris Hayes is sharing this interview. I mean, this is it's insane. It's absurd how dominant this ridiculous narrative is. Well, I mean, I mean, just going back to the question of the left in Syria, it's like it's also that you might not be a leftist if you are making are if you're an apologist for any of these rebel groups or if you are um, edging towards calling for the replacement of a post-colonial Arab state with a Sunni Islamist theocracy that requires uh, NATO or U.S. Inter military intervention. There's just nothing leftist about that. And <laughs> none of this is possible without U.S. intervention. I mean, that's the lesson of Khan Sheikhoun, um, the deployment, you know, the atrocity exhibition of children who were killed by chemical weapons. Um, even assume, even if we assume that um, the Syrian government was responsible for that chemical attack, it revealed the opposition's strategy very clearly, which is that they they have to tug at the heartstrings of suggestible liberals in the West or um, elites like Ivanka Trump to get the U.S. to bomb. And that is the only way that this strategy can be fulfilled. That's the only way the supposedly revolutionary goals of the Syrian opposition can be fulfilled is through the U.S. Air Force. And there, there's nothing leftist about that. And it would, the, the, the rebels, the opposition, the main groups on the ground, whether it's Arar al-Sham, the kind of Syrian Taliban, which has kind of a nationalist narrative. I mean, they're not exactly international jihadists or Hayat Tahrir al-Sham, which is sort of the Syrian al-Qaeda. They basically share similar goals as ISIS, and they've implemented um, – you know, a similar governing structure in places like Idlib. Idlib is basically a penal colony right now for Al Qaeda, and they've implemented an Islamic state. We just published a really great piece at Alternate's Gray Zone by Lindsay Snell, who is one of the few Western reporters who made it into Al Qaeda controlled Idlib, of course. She was kidnapped. At, sure. yeah. at the end, she's kidnapped because she's a Western reporter. You can't really go there, but she. Um, you know, she photographed some of the signs at the checkpoint when you enter Idlib. And, I mean, it's sort of a de facto checkpoint. And um, the signs are, they direct you to a local radio station, 106.7 um, FM, um, which helps lay out the hudud, the, the local laws. No smoking. If you smoke, you will be arrested. Um, just like um, one of the CIA-vetted FSA tow missile operators was this week. I mean, this guy had taken out 70 Syrian government tanks and he was arrested by Idlib authorities for smoking cigarettes. And then you have <laughs> um, the um, dress code, which shows women in full niqab. I mean, you can't just wear hijab. Um, and well, also, just to, just to specify to people, too, like, this is this was not the, the common dress code in this area before these people took over because sometimes people tend to think that, oh, so what? That's what they want. But it's not. They're actually like this is being imposed on people who didn't follow these rules or dress this way. Before. Yeah. Anyways, continue. Well, yeah. Yeah. I mean, the Christians and Druze of Idlib who'd been there for generations and generations and generations. They didn't dress like that before. But then. Well, neither the did the Sunni. Neither did the Sunnis. Like it's like. 
Sure, sure. N neither did all the Sunnis. This was imposed on them. The Christians were slaughtered or driven out. The Druze were forced to convert and to dig up their shrines. It's a really great thing we've created there. It's very... Um, and the Atlantic Council, the think tank in Washington, has celebrated it as fulfilling revolutionary goals. Um, so, 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 so this is this is essentially what's happening on the ground with the opposition, and it's not being discussed in a frank and honest way on Democracy Now. Um, I've never heard it discussed. Uh, the day that Donald Trump authorized 59 cruise missiles uh, at the Shirat Air Base. Um, outside Damascus, uh, Democracy Now!'s guest was um, Lena Sergi, who is an open, uh, aggressive advocate for Western military intervention in Syria and runs this group, the Karam Foundation, which has an advocacy arm to push for regime change. So those are the qu that's the quality of guests Democracy Now! has been hosting. Um, I was in an elevator once with Anand Gopal, and you know I don't I get kind of nervous talking in really close spaces, so I didn't I never really spoke to him. I don't know him. Um, I don't really want to like personally go after him, but it's true that he is a member of the ISO, which is this sectarian group that um, has a very strong position in favor of uh, supporting the Syrian armed opposition. Um, he's also a fellow at the New America Foundation, which is a State Department-funded think tank in Washington. It's a pretty much uh, a wing of the Democratic Party, and it's a hawkish think tank. Um, what, what he said, I don't even think the State Department accepts anymore, which is that <laughs> Assad created ISIS. Assad is responsible for ISIS's creation. This is like essentially a neocon talking point that you would see at the Daily Beast. And it just it, it sort of it sort of glosses over the whole history of ISIS. Um, you know, you always hear these um, these these uh, kind of regime change trolls saying, you deny the agency of the Syrian people. Well, here we sort of den <laughs> we've denied the agency of people who want to join ISIS because of their <laughs> ideological goals. Yeah. I mean, yeah. they have a clear goal of establishing an Islamic state. Uh, they have propaganda that appeals to young men in the West um, and it's very successful. It's very sophisticated. And we should actually listen to the voices of the <laughs> young men who flock from the West, often from backgrounds of extreme discrimination. I wrote a profile of Mohammed Mwazi, uh, who became known as Jihadi John, um, about why he joined ISIS. And it had a lot to do with being under constant surveillance outside London. Um, I interviewed people who knew him when he was a young man in East London, and it really didn't come down to Assad's brutality. <laughs> um, and beyond that, I think this talking point, it, you know, this talking point is designed to whitewash American imperialism because mm -hmm. ISIS is a direct outgrowth of the U.S. occupation of Iraq. I mean, where did Mohammed Jolani meet Abu Bakr Baghdadi? It was at Camp Buka. That was who ran universe. that? Wait, wait, who who ran that again? I'm sorry, I just can't remember. It's like yeah, uh, it was. It, it, I don't know. It was it, I don't think like um, Bashar al-Assad was an American <laughs> camp guard. Or Bashir, Bashir Assar, as Sean Spicer said. Or or as the British like to say, Bashar al-Assad, which I think is so funny, and I laugh. Bashar al-Assad. Bashar al-Assad. Yeah. yeah. So, so so I mean, just for those who aren't really you know, in the know, Camp Buka was one of the main kind of prison camps the U.S. ran during the occupation of Iraq that brought together the sort of jihadist elements um, with, um, the, milit with yeah. the military intelligence apparatus of the Ba'ath Party, which had been, th these guys had been basically thrown out of their jobs and imprisoned because of L. Paul Bremer, the, you know, imperial lord of the occupation's debathification policy. Um, the debathification, and then the looting of Iraq's state um, state resources um, really set the stage not only for the insurgency, but for the rise of ISIS. Um, and, you know, I can start from the beginning, but I don't want to spend a whole lot of time well, also, there. Well, is, I just want to throw in one last thing to that is also there's the Wahhabization. Like, it's like, it, it, you know, I wish communism was like the alter, alter, you know, alternative um sort of ideology that people could have turned to or something or something else. But at the end of the day, there's all, there was also a Wahhabization sort of taking place, like Saudi money that being pumped into, into this, into the region in general is also like created 
fertile ground. It's like all of these things mixed together. But anyways, continue right. with what you were saying. Sure. sure. I mean, there was the, 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 the kind of Salafist political ideology. I mean, there's obviously just a religious sort of apolitical strain of Salafism, but there was a political ideology that was baked into the revolution that was active in a lot of the rural areas that rose up. And a lot of this had to do with the fact that Saudi Arabia spent upwards of $100 billion to export its ideology. Um, a lot of it has to do with, you know, the long running conflict between um, the Syrian government and the Muslim Brotherhood and how um, the, you know, atrocities committed in Hama um, during the 80s sort of led to the Muslim Brotherhood in Syria becoming more extreme. There's a whole history there. Um, well, they so, were, well, yeah, they were already kind of extreme, but yeah. Yeah, I mean, they were whole, way, there's, sure. There's something I was going to say is like, it's interesting you mentioned, because so you say like whitewashing U.S. imperialism and it's like we could keep going like with everything we're saying right now. There's so much of this that always ends up going back to well, the U.S. Well, let, me to, just, like, um, let me just kind of just draw it back to Syria. I mean, Baghdadi, um, on, it was, and this was sort of unknown at the time, sent Jolani, who is the head of, Jab, um, of, of Jabhat al-Nusra, which was the Syrian original Syrian al-Qaeda affiliate, into Syria to start the Islamic – to start a kind of Islamic state. And Jolani was in touch with Sawahiri, who has always kind of bin Laden's eminist Greece, like the number two, the tactician of al-Qaeda. And Zawahiri had kind of learned some lessons from – Al-Qaeda getting kicked out of um, Taliban-controlled Afghanistan, um, and from what Zarqawi was doing in Iraq, which was to actively inflame um, sectarian tensions. What he wanted to do was work his way into the armed Syrian opposition um, and eventually take it over and absorb all of the other armed groups. But this was a really successful strategy that Jolani began to implement. He came in with some 400 men, but there was already... Uh, an active kind of jihadist structure within Syria going back to the Iraq war. And this was, and, and, and this um, led to a split with Baghdadi who wanted to immediately set up a kind of independent Islamic state entity. Um, and that's what really led to the birth of the Islamic state, but the Islamic state wouldn't have been possible if there wasn't an armed rebellion that was being funded and trained by the U.S., the U.K., Turkey, Saudi Arabia, and Qatar, and some other countries. Jordan. And this is and Jordan. Jo and Jordan, of course, which is sort of the U.S. is, you know, basically it's the American military base. But <laughs> this, is, this is what we saw being warned about by the Defense Intelligence Agency in its 2012, um, you know, the sort of infamous cable that there will be a Salafist principality as long in the east of Syria as long as these countries continue pumping arms into Syria and training fighters. And that is exactly what happened. And this is really the reason why the Islamic State was able to find uh, find uh, actual cities to take over. I mean, look at the story. That, that defense intelligence report you just mentioned also even named cities that would be taken over by yeah, the Yeah, Zor and Raqqa. And who, is, who took <laughs> and over so Derezor they, they also said Mosul, too. They said Mosul and a couple other places in Iraq. But, yeah, it's, it's, they, and, they, know, they predicted all of it. They, pre they predicted it all. And, you know, the Defense Intelligence Agency run by, you know, Noam Chomsky um, actually was run by <laughs> – it was actually not run by Chomsky. It was run by you know, the great anti-imperial mind Michael Flynn. Um, <laughs> pointed the finger directly at this covert imperial proxy war that was aimed to split Syria into several pieces and just slowly grind down uh, the government. Um, and that's really what Gopal is whitewashing. And it's a talking point designed to whitewash uh, what the all, all of these outside countries have done to destroy a post-colonial Arab state. Not only that... Um, it 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 just it doesn't hold up. There's there's no way to support it because when you when you look deeper into the talking point, the people who offer it always say, "Well, you know, look at um, all of the jihadists in, in 2011 that Assad let out of." Um, well, Naya it turns prison. out Muhammad. They say things about Muhammad Al Jalani who started Al Nusra. But then it turns out that was from Charles Lister's book was the source. Lister for... basically lied. Jolani, as I, as I pointed out earlier, he came in from Iraq 
after he was in Camp Buka. So, you know, Jolani, who is, you know, the sort of um, founder of the Syrian um, affiliate, of Al Qaeda, Jabhat al Nusra, the largest affiliate of Al Qaeda in history, by the way, um, thanks to the weapons the U.S. is pumping in, um, was not let out in this general amnesty in 2011. The main figure was Zahran Alush, um, this sort of Saudi preacher who had been in prison. And the reason they were let out was because this was the main demand of the Syrian <laughs> opposition. The Syrian opposition's main demand in 2011 was to let all of these cats out. So the idea that Assad has this slick strategy to jihadify the opposition, um, you know, e even if you accept that, and I, I, you know, I kind of don't, um, even if you accept that none of these figures had a strong affiliation with ISIS, and that, you know, was the result of basically the, lo the Syrian government's loss of territory around on the east of the country from Palmyra to Deir ez -Zor Raqqa, and it lost territory because of um, the, this imperial covert war that figures like Anand Gopal are essentially whitewashing. Well, so I want to take it to two things, back to two things. Um, when dealing with, like, the left and even liberals, uh, there's a couple things that are really striking about the position that they take on this because there's the one issue of the fact that they're essentially supporting and whitewashing groups that have genocidal ambitions. And I'm not making, I mean, I'm not, I'm not attributing like that quality to those groups. They say it, um, they say it themselves. You can go watch video after video of these groups and the clerics that they follow calling for like killing minorities, killing specifically the Shia, um, you know, like cleansing the area and, and, and wanting to impose really regressive Saudi style policies. Uh, and so there's that aspect of it of the fact that like somehow we're supposed to not care about minorities in the Middle East, even though as progressives and leftists and liberals, that's like an essential um, part of what we care about in our own country is like equality for minorities. And, and the other issue here is also the issue of Islamophobia. So obviously there's a lot of Islamophobia in the West and the U S right now under someone like Donald Trump, especially, and it's very, very bad. Um, that said, it does seem to me as though a lot of people will say, like, I've been called an Islamophobe for not only criticizing Salafism, but for calling rebel groups that are either Salafi jihadists or rebel groups that are calling for, like, genocide, for criticizing those groups as bad. I've been called an Islamophobe for that. So it's kind of this, like, taking the rhetoric around Islamophobia that's really important in the West and projecting it onto the Middle East where it doesn't fit and trying to say that Assad or or not just Assad, but like people in the Middle East who are fighting these kinds of groups are Islamophobic for doing so, even though they're also Muslims. I don't, do you see what I'm saying? Anyways, like how do you respond to those kinds of what I think are really ridiculous, um, absurd accusations? <laughs> well, you, you've given me a lot to yeah. respond to, so um, maybe I'll start Where with the start? La <laughs> start with the last point. I mean, and and I think um, you know if anyone wants to look at, you know, our body of work or my body of work and what I've been doing. Um, you know, we were challenging this idea of Islamophobia before liberals knew it existed. I mean, mm -hmm. I was sticking my neck out for care, the council on American Islamic relations, you know, any, any time I could speaking at any gala I was invited to and getting pretty strongly attacked as a self-hating Jew and a, you know, sort of um, a stooge for creeping Sharia by Islamophobic elements. Um, during the Obama era, you actually didn't see it, the kind of opposition from liberals to Islamophobia that you do now. Um, and, uh, you know, but after I wrote about the White Helmets, the Syrian sort of civil defense group, which is really um, in, it also functions as sort of a public relations arm, um, for the Syrian opposition, works with PR firms to advance uh, Western military intervention in Syria and is really one of the most sophisticated propaganda scams I've ever seen um, to, to push a kind of humanitarian intervention that would be disastrous. Um, I saw, you know, directors of care, um, like the L.A. director, um, um, Hussam Ailush calling for me to be boycotted by Muslims, um, basically saying not only was I, you know, Islamophobic, but I was like, um, I was like Hitler, 
Um, I was even accused uh, by to be, the... To be fair, Max, he said that about you, me, and Ali Abunima. No, no that was um, <laughs> Zahar Salu. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. I'm mixing up my people. My bad. I'm mixing He's, up uh, the people who hate us. Yeah. Um, <laughs> then you have um, Ahmed Rehab in Chicago. It's called me a Holocaust denier, um, which is really... <laughs> Wonderful as a, a Jew to be accused of that. He's the director of Chicago's care chapter. So, I mean, everything I, 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 I tried to do is sort of washed away once I criticized the, you know, this sort of this what, what they would consider the Syrian revolution. Um, and there was sort of an implication that what I had said and done was Islamophobic, which really reminded me of a lot of the manipulation, the kind of manipulated Hasbara tactics that were directed against me by the pro-Israel crowd, um, where they basically would accuse you of attacking the Jewish people. They would sort of personify the state of Israel, or what we call the Jewish state in Israel and the Levant, or JSIL, um, and they would mm-hmm. accuse you of attacking the Jewish people if you harshly criticized it or if you called for the kind of, um, you know, regime of equality that we'd like to see in Israel-Palestine. You know, you're you're not only, like, destroying Israel, you're you're verging on calling for the genocide of the Jewish people. And what they've done is even sort of conflated the most extreme um, ideology um, of, of the most extreme ideological wing of Zionism, which is a political ideology and a political project. They've conflated it with a religious faith community. And that's the same tactic that we've seen Syrian regime change trolls use, where they conflate um, a political project that's being advanced by the Syrian armed opposition, which is explicitly to implement a Islamist-oriented, exclusively Sunni state in place of an authoritarian post-colonial Arab state. Um, And they've conflated it with Muslims in general. And so that's where the Islamophobia allegation comes from. It's ridiculous. And it, it's, um, and it's a form of, uh, it's a silencing tactic and a form of manipulation. That's really dangerous. Um, it's dangerous because represents the flip side of the Islamophobic argument, which is that the jihadists you see in Idlib or in Raqqa really represent a true vision of Islam. That's what Pam Geller Robert Spencer say. Um, mm-hmm. That's what Nigel Farage says. That's what Islamophobes believe. And it's essentially what the supporters of those groups are saying as well. I mean, it, and, and so it's dangerous in that regard. The, 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 the kind of growth and proliferation of these groups will increase Islamophobia. There's no doubt about that. And then beyond that, we have to look at the refugee crisis and how it's discussed, especially by liberals. I mean, you have, first of all, 7 million Syrians who are internally displaced. They have fled from rebel-controlled areas. Um, Some of them have fled from rebel-controlled areas because, yes, the Syrian and Russian governments are bombing there. and There's chaos. They've also fled because they don't want to live under the kind of theocratic regime that's been imposed in East Ghouta, uh, in Idlib, and all these other places. And it's just, I mean, you look at what's happening in East Ghouta right now. All of the rebel groups are fighting each other. It's kind of like a war of the warlords, which is what Syria would look like if the government falls. So you have these 7 million IDPs. Then you have something like uh, 11 million refugees. You have millions of refugees pouring out of Libya. And you continue to have refugees pouring out of Iraq. And in the West, you have liberals ready to welcome these refugees with open arms. I'm, I'm one of them. Like I was so proud when I got to visit Canada to see how that society, at least in the cities like Ottawa, has welcomed refugees and treated them with dignity. We don't do that in the U.S. We're so miserly here. But nobody has an analysis of why there are refugees or what it's doing to our politics in the West. And then we just kind of look at all of these um, kind of working you know, lower middle class white people in Europe who are voting for Brexit, they're voting for Le Pen, and just condemn them as fascists. And we never have any analysis about why this is happening. What the hell happened in Libya? What's happening in Syria? (laughs) What happened in Iraq? And where were all of these people um, hollering about fascism um, to protest any of these wars? I mean, it's. I know where they were. I can tell you. 
exactly like Chris Hayes, for example, were cheering on the NATO intervention in Libya. I just want to throw that out there. Yeah, I mean, and, <laughs> and, 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 you know, yeah. OK, Muammar Gaddafi and his sons at the time made a direct appeal um, to far right elements in the West. It's 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 undeniable. And they said that you will be deluged with refugees um, and you don't want that in your societies. The problem is Assad, Assad said the same thing. Assad yeah. has said the same thing. And the problem is that they're right. It happened. They were proven right. And when you look at the Brexit vote, for example, OK, the real issue was the economy and the relationship with the EU and what the euro is doing, what austerity is doing to the UK. But you look at how that campaign was run by UKIP, the far right party of Nigel Farage. It was run through billboard campaigns across um, you know, northern England and these economically devastated areas showing masses of Syrian refugees marching across Central Europe. And it was warning that they're coming your way because Europe and the globalists are going to bring them there. And in the end, 80 percent of people who voted for leave, 80 percent voted on the issue of immigration. UKIP drove that campaign through the refugee crisis it's, and, it, and, and UKIP benefited. Then you look at in the UK, who is who is linking the refugee crisis to war, to the systematic destruction by the West of Syria? It's Nigel Farage on the far right and Jeremy Corbyn, the Labour Party, who's considered far left. I kind of consider him to be like the most moderate person in the UK. <laughs> um, and and both of and, and Corbyn is under full scale assault by the alt center of Labour and the Tories. And Farage is is just, you know, those of us on the left can just dismiss him as a fascist. But every time he's proven right about what hap- what, how our foreign policy is driving him to the top and influencing British voters to the right. And that's why he keeps demagoguing on this issue. Um, there has to be an alternative from the left. And what we've seen in the U.S. when you talk, when, when, to just to bring it back to kind of to, to the democracy now discussions and the discussions in supposed left circles, I really. I don't Jacobin even know being one of them, too, I guess. Jacobin. Yeah, I mean, there was an editorial takeover at Jacobin that kind of ousted the kind of anti-imperialist elements like Max Ayo. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, they just refused to make this linkage. They refuse to – instead, they're actually – what they're doing in effect is um, campaigning for more people to be thrown – forced to flee their homes into the West, and then they'll welcome them with open arms. Um, and You know, also, Max, like you just made me think of this, is that um, with this – with the particularly with like the more Jacobin crowd, uh, they often get – they often get hated on for trying to explain like the issue of, you know, the rise of Trump and stuff as a product of abandoning the white working class of the democratic party or abandoning the like lower middle class of white work window class yeah. or whatever. But they actually also, you know, I think a better argument and a more factual argument would be what you just explained about Brexit, which is that the increase in not just refugees, but the propaganda around refugees, which is the product of these wars that we've started, our country started, is actually helping the far right make the xenophobic arguments and campaigns that are end up being successful, which is what Trump pretty much campaigned on. And you won't ever even see Jacobin say that, ever. It's kind of I shocking. Mean, I mean, you just have to acknowledge the reality, and the reality for the refugees is, is it's just terrible. I mean, people, these you have millions of people. You have an entire generation. I mean, everyone 18 and below, who have been in and out of displaced persons camps with very they're, they're, they don't have access to education. They're traumatized. They have they're stateless, and then they're dumped in Europe, um, where people are far. Um, you know, my experience in Europe is people just don't have as much. A, of tolerance for multiculturalism. They don't have as much tolerance for other people. I mean, maybe it's it's different in in urban areas of France and, and the UK, but it's they're treated with you know out, outright open hostility. How is that? How are they going to get organized? How is that going to affect politics in the future? How are stateless people in Europe going to get organized? Um, what will happen if they're deported again? It's just there's 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 there aren't really any answers that I see coming from these institutional left circles and 
there are, and the root issue isn't being addressed, which is a covert proxy war, which has systematically destroyed this country. Instead, what you see is constant moral uh, posturing and virtue signaling about what should be done to hold Assad accountable. And of course, <laughs> I, I don't want to you know name any names, but I keep hearing this this talking about. I want to see him held accountable, and it's so. On. What does that mean to hold him accountable? It means what sending him to the ICC, which is what I would call the ACC, the African Criminal Courts, and only, <laughs> you only see black leaders put on trial there. Um, so maybe they'll put a they'll put a brown leader on trial before like the white man, the white men of the West, and that will be like how the leftists want to you know hold someone accountable. Um, and what what is he being held accountable for? I mean the yeah the, okay there's there are massive atrocities. Um, it, I mean it, he's it, not it, doing anything to be honest. He's not doing anything different than what America's doing in Iraq, um, like to well, areas controlled he's, by ISIS. He's, su he's suppressing an insurgency with Vietnam-era weapons. There's going to be massive atrocities. Um, what, 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 what should happen in Syria? Does, does the left really have any answer for that? Who will replace him? Um, they have this guy. Um, the um, feminist Riyadh, uprising in Idlib will replace they him. Have this, well, they have this woke leftist guy in London named Riyadh Hijab, who's sort of the putative leader of the Syrian opposition. He's the one who's going to come in and <laughs> save Syria. Who is this guy? He's a former Ba'athist who's completely supported by Saudi Arabia, who rolled out his political program, which was written for him by the former chief of staff of Tony Blair, and it was paid for. <laughs> by Saudi Arabia through the Institute of International Security Studies, this militaristic think tank. Um, is that, you know, is this that is, Israeli? Is that an Israeli think tank, or am I, no, am I wrong? You're, you're thinking of, um, of, um, the, of Some, the Institute something for... Something similar acronym. You're thinking of the, the Institute for National Security Studies, I think. No, whatever. Herzliya. Anyway, it, it's a woke leftist think tank. Uh, funded oh. by Bahrain, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, and <laughs> it's a um, so thing, thing. so. I mean, you know, none of these people. We we did another piece at um, the Gray Zone Project at Alternet that Ben Norton wrote for us on all of the Libya the pundits who favored um, NATO's intervention in Libya, which represented the systematic destruction of a post-colonial Arab state under the guise of humanitarian intervention, you know, and Anne-Marie Slaughter, you know, the aptly named Anne-Marie Slaughter, <laughs> you know, she, she cheered it on. She cheered it on and she's cheering on what's happening in Syria. Nick Kristoff cheered it on, and, you know, but what happened was after Libya was destroyed and the refugee crisis exploded and some 24 Islamist militias um, competed for control of what was left of Libya, and the arms were basically shipped through the rat line through Turkey to the Syrian rebels, um, including possibly chemical weapons, um, and the state resources were looted by France. After that happened, all of the pundits and the sort of humanitarian idiot liberals, or what I call idlibs, uh, they all <laughs> shut up. They all shut up and they move on to another thing. And that's exactly what the neocons do. They just look for Michael Weiss. He, I mean, who is this cat? He looks for one state after another to one state after another that isn't aligned with the West to destroy. He fashions himself as an expert and then moves on to the next one. Um, mm -hmm. And now he's become a CNN correspondent. I mean, this is a veteran neoconservative operative. Has this, guy ever, has this guy ever been on the ground anywhere, by the way? Like, I love how he's a, an, an analyst for doing what? For, like, reading things on the Internet and then writing bad analysis? He went into Syria for a few hours and took some selfies with some Islamist rebels. Um, and then he... So did John McCain. Was, yeah, well, <laughs> it was at that time that he was um, Lizzo Baggy's groomer. And he kind of presented her as this expert on the Syrian rebels who spoke Arabic. And John Kerry touted her during in 2013 when they were trumping up U.S. intervention and destroying another state after Libya, um, tr you know, trumpeted her as the person who knows that the Syrian rebels favor freedom and democracy and that they're basically, you know, Thomas Jefferson with an FSA flag and without slaves. <laughs> and it turned out that... Maggie, Liz O'Baggy, um, just like um, Michael Weiss, is a complete fraud. She had faked her PhD. Um, she she was working for um, Kimberly Kagan's think tank, which is funded by the weapons industry. 
and was just another, you know, it was just another neocon scam operation. Luckily, she was exposed at the time. Um, and yes, she was working closely with Moaz Mustafa, um, who is this sort of Syrian regime change lobbyist in Washington from the State Department funded Syrian Emergency Task Force. And he was who also he's a Palestinian and I'm pretty sure has never, ever, ever done like aimed any of his work at like helping liberate Palestine. I yeah, yeah, yeah. That no, he just he just uses the Palestine card to try to like appeal to people who care about Palestine. But mm -hmm. um, anyway, you know, he's the one who took John McCain into Syria um, to meet with um, two uh, one of them was, I think, named Ibrahim Noor, two, basically two rebels who had just recently, you know, had a great time kidnapping Shia pilgrims. Um, and so this was ex another propaganda flop. Um, Liz Obagi gets exposed and she goes right into McCain's office to work for him. She just basically gets absorbed into that whole operation. So this anyway, this whole thing is an operation, is my point. And you have all of these columnists who are like these automaton drones who can only clamor for intervention using the same tactics again and again, they're very much, they dominate the mainstream narrative. Um, they represent sort of an official narrative and they're working not only for, you know, the state department in many ways, but the weapons industry funds their work um, and the Gulf states fund their work. So they're, they're working for, um, entities that don't exactly, I don't think, really have the interests of the Syrian people or the American people at heart. Um, and so when you talk about the left and you talk about Jacobin or what, what's, what you, the, 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 the prevalent narrative on democracy now, which is really not, I don't think it's not really Amy Goodman's fault. I find her to be kind of disengaged on this issue. It's really the hand of Nermeen Sheikh, who's come in as kind of a co-host. Um, there, there are redundancies the, the left that's pushing this narrative is it's just a redundant narrative because it's the same thing you see Thomas Friedman, Nicholas Kristof, the Atlantic Council, Center for American Progress, this whole network of think tanks which sort of represent the private wing of the deep state advancing. So what what the left has done is it's become a redundancy. Um, the, 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 the sort of line the, itself, the, the line left. itself with well, yeah, the line itself with neocons and liberal interventionists, and that's what's like, and so, Israel. I mean, let's let's yeah. let's be real. How do Palestinians, you know, how do Palestinian activists justify the fact that they are completely, entirely, ideologically and strategically in line with the mil the Israeli military intelligence apparatus on Syria? I mean, Israel has made no. Uh, attempt to conceal what its what its intentions in Syria are, and that includes supporting, funding, and not, not funding, but supporting um, and providing logistical support to the to the rebels uh, for an obvious reason. Um, Israel benefits from the weakening of the Syrian state that's propping that that is uh, supporting Hezbollah. How do they explain that? How do they explain that like Refugees International just had this giant refugee advocacy group just had a gala in Washington where it honored the white helmets. I mean, you have to honor the white helmets in any award ceremony. It's like if you're an insurance company, you have to make the white helmets the employee of the month. Like, yeah, yeah. I mean, you have to promote the white helmets to middle manager at your uh, used car company if you work for Hertz. Anyway, oh, so they, oh. well, let me just make this point. Yeah. They honored the white helmets, and one of the companies, the corporations, that had supported the gala, which was on the invitations, was Caterpillar, the number one target <laughs> of the BDS movement, which Are has created joking? so many refugees. I mean, hundreds of thousands of refugees or thousands of refugees have been created by Caterpillar, the bulldozer wow. company. How do Palestine solidarity activists square this reality? Well, we're supposed to be divesting from them over Palestine. Like, you just like, what you just, Caterpillar is like the company that sells its shit to Israel, like bulldozers to Israel to literally demolish Palestinian homes. So, yes, yeah, so That's the white crazy. helmets send the the white helmets send a official representatives to an accept an award from um, Caterpillar and other woke companies like Blackstone Capital. I think Joe Lieberman <laughs> was in the audience. I mean, it's what, how how Are you it's, it's, it's kidding it's, me? It's an RRL scam. <laughs> <laughs> Matt, that was the lamest, funniest thing I've heard you come up it's with a, out of this a, conflict. It's a Jabhat Fatal scam. <laughs>
You know, well, actually, this ties kind of into what you were saying before. Um, when you said before how about what Max Isle said about Palestinian divestment campaigns uh, having decreased dramatically because of, you know, uh, these Syrian intervention people inserting themselves into Palestine solidarity or, should, or trying to use Palestine solidarity as a vehicle to sell intervention in Syria. Uh, this, in a way, that that breakdown of what took years and decades, I should say, to create, which is like popular Palestine solidarity groups, is um, come. It's kind of like mirroring a few years later what's happened in the Middle East, uh, which is that you know Hezbollah is one of the biggest. Um, it's one of the main like deterrents to Israeli aggression in Lebanon. Is the is the Israeli de deterrent to aggression in Lebanon? Or deterrent to Israeli aggression, right? Yeah, and um, and uh, and at the same time, the um, Syrian revolution, the Syrian devolution, we should call it, um, has really uh, you know split Arabs in a way like I've never ever seen, uh, to the point where you have people here now who like want you know who hate Hezbollah based purely on sectarian um, hatred. Like there's just the, the way that it's really sad what's taken place here. I mean, like the support for what they call all the resistance. Everybody in the U.S. likes to make fun of the resistance axis. You know, they say it in, like, derogatory yeah, ways, especially yeah. leftists. They're like, oh, you just care about the resistance axis. But, like, if you actually are in the Middle East, it's really important that there's a resistance axis. And what that means is, like, resistance to American imperialism in the region, which is done through Israel and Saudi Arabia. <laughs> um, that's, like, the main, you know, the main American partners that carry that mission out. And Hezbollah is a, like, you know, organic indigenous group that is capable of pushing Israel out of southern Lebanon. And, and also, like, you know, it's funded by Iran, which is one of the only countries in the region left, other than Syria, sort of, um, that acts independently. doesn't mean Iran's perfect or that it's great. It just means that it doesn't do what America tells it to do, right? And that's why it has to be destroyed. Um, but essentially what you have here is, like, there used to be support for Hezbollah across lines. Like, in 2007... You know, Sunnis in the north were celebrating Hassan Nasrallah just as, yeah. like, the Shia in the south were. <clears throat> now, yeah. Hassan Nasrallah and Hezbollah are hated in the north. I mean, people, the sectar I mean, I've never seen the sectarianism, like, like the way it is or has been in the past couple of years, ever. I mean, there wasn't an issue, actually, like an inter-Muslim issue the way there is now. Um, and so the point is, is who does that help? It helps Israel. And so it just reminds me of what you're saying with the Palestine divestment stuff. It's almost like a microcosm of what's taking place here, which is that this sectarian divide. And I want to emphasize how sectarian it is. And that's not to say that, like, it's not to say that, you know, all Sunnis are on one side and all Shias are on another. It's just, it's just to say that the, um, the really, like, almost like secularization of the sectarian narrative has impacted every, like, just it, it's inflamed identity politics in the region. And now that's kind of migrated to the U.S., so the point is, is it's it, what's taking place with Palestine solidarity, I feel like is just a couple of years late almost in what's actually happened in the region, which is there is no solidarity. Like yeah. the solidarity has broken down. And now it's a situation where when is, I mean, Israel and Hezbollah are going to get into it again eventually. And when they do, um, I think there's going to be a lot of people in Lebanon even who are going to be cheering uh, for Israel to take down Hezbollah. Yeah, I, I, I think uh... – I mean, the real trigger point was the sort of tidal wave of propaganda around East Aleppo last year, which culminated in December with the extrication, the kind of violent extrication of extremist rebels from these five neighborhoods in East Aleppo. And the U.S. was just deluged. I mean, if you look at mentions in the news of Aleppo, it was one of the top headlines. And that was the product of the really successful um, PR that was not only being run out of Aleppo, but southern Turkey and by public relations firms based in Washington. I mean, the, and, 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 it, and it forced people to kind of decide where they stood on this issue. And many people... Um, particularly Arabs fell down on fell, fell on it on sectarian lines. I mean, if you're Shia, if you're Christian, if uh, you you might not want to support people who are openly sworn to your destruction in Syria, and like that is the language that you hear from someone like Abdullah Mohaseni, the Saudi cleric who was sort of the inspiration of many of the rebels in East Aleppo and is on the um, religious courts in Idlib. He's one of the 
you know, the major fig, his jihad callers network raised millions of dollars um, in weapons to help the rebels take Idlib in 2015. He's a major figure. And you just listen to the rhetoric he's using. It's exterminationist rhetoric um, about minorities. And, you know, then you have, you know, the Alawite leader of Syria. I mean, there's there's so much resentment of the fact that you have a minority group controlling a country supposedly controlling a country yeah. the majority Sunni there's not really much of an analysis about that or an understanding of who's living in the government areas who's in what government position um, how many Sunnis comprise the Syrian army um, but yeah it's definitely uh, I've never seen um, the Middle East and the discussion around the Middle East more sectarian um, there's been a ricochet effect into the kind of work we've been doing over the past seven years, and it's been extremely negative for anyone working around Palestine circles. Um, you know, and, as, an uh, Arab, as an Arab, like as someone from an Arab minority group, I actually never, ever, ever, ever saw myself as like, as like, oh, I'm from like a Druze family. Like that was never an issue until Syria. I never thought ever. of it. I never thought of the sectarian issue um, either. Um, I, I remember being blindsided um, at a meeting of uh, American Muslims for Palestine. They have these giant conferences in Chicago. And Chicago is um, a base of the you know, Syrian diaspora, the Syrian exile community in the U.S. Um, and the, the, I think this was 2013. The conference was just completely overtaken by the issue of Syria. Um, there was very – it was almost like there was very little interest in the room. Um mm-hmm. On Palestine, and Syrian uh, opposition figures were brought on stage, and there was just so much enthusiasm in the room for the revolution. It completely blindsided me. I felt like, um, you know, whatever I said was just sort of an afterthought. It was window dressing, and that the real agenda here um, for an organization that was, you know, supposedly created to mobilize Muslims um, around the issue of Palestine had been completely diverted and it was there was a there was a you know an, an an energy around it that I didn't fully understand now I understand it and when there mm-hmm. is a conflict on the northern border there will be I mean it it seems like Israel is prepping for a war with Hezbollah it'll be a mm-hmm. huge test for the people who cast their lot with the Syrian opposition because the Syrian opposition is um, in a de facto alliance with Israel on the issue of Hezbollah. Um, mm-hmm. you, and, 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 and you listen to the language from someone like Moshe Yaalon, the former defense minister of Israel. I love this guy because he's just so honest. <laughs> in Israel, they have this thing called being dugri. Uh, it just means, you know, you're straightforward and it shows how macho and tough you are. And all of the guys, in the, a lot of the guys in the military intelligence apparatus are dugri. And so he said, you know, when it comes to a choice between Hezbollah and ISIS, I prefer ISIS. I mean, those are the words of Moshe Alon. He, he recently he recently acknowledged that um, he recently acknowledged that um, an ISIS faction, um, I think in Kunetra, the Golan Heights um, near Israel, had fired a stray mortar into Israel, and that the uh, defense ministry in Israel received a formal apology from ISIS. <laughs> That they forgave them. I mean, Israel has this whole policy of like never forgive any of the Arabs who fire on you, and to, you know your whole deterrence policy is like <laughs> your whole deterrence policy is like the Elliot Ness style of like they take one of yours to the hospital, you take two of theirs to the morgue. But when ISIS <laughs> comes and shoots a mortar at you and apologizes nicely, I don't know if they sent like um, like a Hallmark card, but Israel accepted. <laughs> they accepted the. And you see this happen again and again and again. Then you see whenever, um, you know, the Syrian army is skirmishing on the southern border with, you know, an al-Nusra faction, which is operate like the southern command of the rebels is basically a coalition of al-Qaeda and the free Syrian army. Um, and sometimes ISIS participates. Um, Israel often shells in support of the rebels against the Syrian army. So they're shelling in support of al-Qaeda. So I think there's going to be a big test. Um for people who have um, developed this kind of sectarian view of the Syrian conflict, which is overridden whatever, you know, left wing or geopolitical anti-imperial considerations they might have had. And that test will arrive um, with a 
kind of escalation on the northern border of Israel. Yeah, and um, go, sorry, go ahead, Kevin. Well, I just wanted to get in a question. I mean, we're coming up on an hour. We probably should be wrapping soon. And uh, it's been nice to listen to both of you go back and forth. I didn't want to interrupt <laughs> the flow of uh, what you were saying because, I mean, I, I just I humbly say that I probably don't have much to add. You guys are the experts on what have been discussed here. But I did want to ask you, Max, um, about your experience covering events over the last months and what your thoughts are on what having this frenzy over Russia or the Kremlin has maybe done to your coverage of the Middle East and and if you feel like that's an added pressure and, and how you feel that because it does seem one of the things I felt very distinctly as I tried to unravel what had happened with Khan Sheikhoun in the attack is that you were not allowed to investigate whether it came from a rebel group or an al-Qaeda group or if it came from Bashar al-Assad, you were just supposed to accept that there could absolutely be no confusion. There's no such thing as fog of war. Suggesting fog of war exists is actually like a a bigoted way of treating the rebels. Right. (laughs) Well, I I mean, I've spent the last few months, um, I've been kind of, I haven't been publishing many articles because I've been working on a draft of a book where I'm trying to spell out a lot of the ideas that we discussed today and put them in kind of a coherent historical narrative. I think a lot of um, younger people, people in their 20s, don't remember Iraq. They don't remember 9-11. They don't understand the, maybe some of the historical origins. And so I want it, – it's kind of a personal book because I was born in 1977 and, you know, 79 was such a pivotal year for so many reasons. Um, one of the reasons was I think – The monster was let out of the box when the U.S. began uh, the covert operations in Afghanistan. Um, And you can trace that to 9-11. And you can trace 9-11, obviously, to the war in Iraq. And all of these factors have turned the West to the right, have set Islamophobia on fire. And I think they're major factors in the rise of Donald Trump. So that's kind of the narrative I've been working on. And as I was writing it, this Russia stuff began happening. Um, (laughs) The de- I mean, it was actually the day after uh, um, Trump's uh, Hillary Clinton lost. Paul Krugman declared just matter of factly that Russia had hacked the election. This is like a Nobel Prize winning economist from Princeton. It's just like Russia hacked the election. <laughs> like, what the hell are you talking about? Then a few days later, he said Donald Trump might, will deploy a um, false flag terror attack. Um, he suggested that Trump would do a false flag terror attack like the Reichstag fire to um, – I'll put the U.S. under emergency rule. And I realized like, li- liberals are, have gone completely insane. The election has driven them absolutely insane. And so I started looking into a lot of the um, allegations about Russian interference. And, you know, they seem plausible on the surface. I mean, there's no reason to think that the Russian government of Vladimir Putin and everyone else would want Hillary Clinton, who compared Putin to Hitler in office. Um, and they you know, have hacking capacity. But the more I look into it and kind of get granular with it and look at the firms, the for-profit um, cyber security firms that the D- Democratic National Committee used to investigate the hacking firms like CrowdStrike, it starts to look like weapons of mass destruction in Iraq to me. It just looks like another <laughs> scam. And we have to ask kind of where does this lead? I mean, first of all, it leads it, – it allows the Democratic establishment – that failed, that's responsible for one of the most titanic political failures in history, to sink its teeth back into the liberal grassroots, which is known as, you know, the resistance, um, kind of making, making a mockery of the whole concept of resistance. Um, you know, they remind me increasingly of like the John Birch Society, but instead of like crew cuts and 10 gallon brims, they've got these supposedly hand knitted pink pussy hats. <laughs> um, like it's a very right wing liberal grassroots under the influence of the Democratic establishment. Now, Hillary Clinton has declared that she's a member of it. So, you know, any any resistance that welcomes Hillary Clinton, you can kind of call that maybe the status quo. Well, you sound um, like a, you sound like a sexist to me. I'll tell you that right now. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you can you just just call me a misogynist because I. I made fun of like pink hats, you know, (laughs) those pink hats represent womanhood. And if you're, you know, you're not, you're not, if you're not with her, you're not with all women. 
Yeah, anyway, she represents me. Anyway, it's gonna uh, be nasty. You know, the, the Russian <laughs> narrative has been a device for the democratic establishment to, you know, kind of retrench its control over the liberal grassroots. It's allowed it to oppose Trump without doing anything remotely progressive. It's actually subsumed a lot of the more um, important progressive grassroots organizing that was happening before the election, Black Lives Matter, um, a lot of the, you know, Standing Rock. Um, and then after the election, the airport protests, I thought were really notable and interesting in the way they occupied a heavily securitized public space. And that's, that's just been completely washed away with a lot of this Russia hysteria. Um, you also have to look at how that narrative influenced the drive to war in Syria. When you listen to Senator Ben Cardin from Maryland, when he says, we were attacked by Russia and we have to respond, the narrative from Congress, and this was completely a talking point the Democrats ginned up, was that this was an act of war by Russia, that Russia had waged an act of war. And of course, Trump is the fifth column. That's what the you know Center for American Progress has said that there's a fifth column in America and it's in the it's 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 the far right. So you have a Russian fifth column that's waging war on America. So what what do you do? You go Trump into bombing a Russian ally. So it's it's, it's an extremely dangerous narrative that can only lead to more military intervention and a more right wing Democratic Party where Hillary Clinton is a welcome member of the resistance. It's like, yeah, I'm going to go, um, I'm going to, you know, you, you, you know, we came, we saw he died. I got, you know, Gaddafi sodomized with a bayonet in the street. And now I'm going to go have like, go to a, like a, an LGBT dance party outside of, um, Ivanka Trump and Jared Kushner's house. <laughs> like that's, that's kind of like what the resistance is at this point. That's not much of a resistance at all. And the Russian narrative is just, made sure that that's the case. You, you know, the, a lot of the people that I came up with in politics, the progressive bloggers, the people around um, Daily Coast and Raw Story in these places, they played an important role in the Bush era. And now I, I just, I feel like it's like their brains have been rotted. Um, they, we, we, they, they used to be anti-war. Now increasingly they're, they're thirsting for a kind of, at least another cold war with Russia and it just demonstrates a total lack of principle or political foundation of American liberalism. Yeah, it's really depressing um, to to watch all that because it feels like increasingly we're kind of the um, like we're at more and more of the margins. We're the alt left, remember? Yeah. <laughs> like seriously, I mean that's how it starts to feel. Like you're just like. A part of, I mean, I used to feel at least like we were on the same side as a lot of people, but now I've just, I mean, called like a sectarian druze by someone we had on the show, <laughs> Shane Bauer. And, well, that's, <laughs> you know, like it's well, that was, well, no, he didn't, what did he say? It was like a standard druze opinion or? Oh, generic, generic, generic. sectarian <laughs> druze, which is well, really funny because there's no generic anything because like the druze, like 70% of the druze in Lebanon support a guy who like supports Nisra. So that really doesn't well, even make sense. I looked at what he had to say on Twitter and I found it to be a generic upper middle class white position. <laughs> That's actually more accurate than what he said about me. So yeah, I'm with you on that. But no, I mean, the Russia stuff has definitely tainted everything. And then of course, Syria plays a role in that. And I actually want to ask you, maybe we can, this can be one of the like last questions since we've been on for a while. Um, when it comes to the sort of in, 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 intersection, if you will, uh, between the Russia and Syria issues, uh, it does seem as though, I don't know, it seems as though the Trump administration has, has like, been convinced or is increasingly leaning towards the idea of um, of pushing the regime change stuff in, in Syria, of, you know, because of, A, because of the Russia issue, but also because there's people who really want to take out Iran, and Syria's, I guess, maybe in their minds a way to do that. But what do you see? It's really unpredictable, but I guess what would you forecast is going to take place? It does seem like the... They're come, the administration is moving more towards what Obama was doing before with Syria or worse. I mean, you have elements in the administration that would like to sort of de-link Russia from Iran. And that's kind of, you know, you, you saw this language even from Trump after um, the bombing, the cruise missile attack on Syria, which is that Russia needs to stop working with Iran. And uh, it's not going to happen. 
that that right. to me that's re- that's really coming from James Mattis, the Defense Secretary. I mean, he's a Marine who went through the '80s when the U.S. was sort of engaged in this, this like like serious hostilities with Iran, and Marines were dying as a result. Um, he's just sworn eternal hostility to Iran, and you know, there's a reason they call him Mad Dog, and I don't exactly feel safe with him at defense secretary although in washington the pundit class kind of calls him a voice of reason um you have to kind <laughs> yeah. of you have to look at what's happening in astana which is where the negotiations are taking place um russia turkey iran a lot of the main players um in syria have kind of agreed to safe zones and to sort of a de-escalation um, the U.S. seems to be standing on the sidelines and uh, um, supporting what's happening there. And then you have the Saudi-backed Syrian opposition, um, the, the main negotiating figure there is Mohammed Alush, who's the cousin of Zahran Alush, the founder of Jaysh al-Islam. Really great guy. Controls, wonderful guy who paraded Alawite captives in cages um, as human shields. Um, in 2015 very, in East Ghouta. Very Kuta. liberal, very liberal and any, progressive of him. But in any case, the, reb, the rebels have sort of adopted a rejectionist line. They want territory back that they've lost um, as a condition for agreeing to cease fires. Then you have the more powerful groups on the ground like Hayat Tahrir al-Shem in Idlib protesting what's happening in Astana. Um, Trump's bombing of Syria encouraged this rejectionism because the real goal of the Syrian opposition is not to negotiate for some scraps. It's to induce the West to do what it did in Libya, um, to bomb on humanitarian grounds and topple the regime. And as I said at the top of the podcast, the only way that it can trigger Western bombing is by tugging at the heartstrings of suggestible liberals through atrocity exhibition, which... um, has led to rumors, and I think they're like totally unsubstantiated rumors. I'm not going along with them at all, but you can understand why these rumors are spreading around Syrian government areas and pro-government circles, and it's that the rebels will stage um, a chemical attack because that will trigger the red line um, to get the U.S. to do something more substantial than one cruise missile attack That was basically like a symbolic attack that Trump did, according to his son, to prove that there's no Russia connection. I mean, that's what Eric Trump said. So, you know, he was kind of trying to mollify all of the resistance liberals by bombing an airfield. Um, (laughs) Hillary Clinton recently at one of she was at like another one of these kind of corporate colonial feminist conferences. where the, (laughs) The hashtag behind her was like that. She brings peace. And every time she goes to these corporate feminist conferences she calls for bombing some shit and she (laughs) said she complained that trump hadn't bombed enough um and she said that she was upset that trump had notified russia in advance it seemed like she wanted trump to have bombed russian assets so that we could go to world war three or world war four i don't know what war we're in now um (laughs) so there 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 that means she's clearly speaking not just for herself but for powerful elements in Washington that would like to see more bombing in Syria. Um, but I think the, the parties involved outside of Saudi Arabia and the Gulf states that have invested billions in the opposition would like to see this conflict move to some sort of denouement um, where they each kind of divide up Syria according to their own needs, particularly um, Turkey in the north. Yeah, I guess that, that, that does seem where it's headed. It's like everybody kind of wants to, like, you know, uh, cash their cash out in, yeah. in Syria. That's a good way of putting it. <laughs> it's like it's time. We've reached that point where now at least we can make money off of reconstruction and take over various, like, regions. Um, but, you know, that said, I just want to end on one note, and that is the – you mentioned Hillary Clinton. And um, this is separate from Syria, but I'm still receiving this nasty pile on from all these Hillary Clinton, like – the Hillary Clinton troll army uh, from the primaries is like still in effect. And I think it's actually nastier than it was a year ago. Oh, they persisted. Um, they, they, <laughs> they did. That's, Indeed. that's you know, like, her, <laughs> like herpes, they persisted. <laughs> she persisted. As, uh, that should be <laughs> like herpes. We should write a children's book in the um, tradition of Chelsea Clinton. How do we, how do, where's the, like, they persisted. 
Where's the Valtrex for these people? <laughs> Seriously. Seriously. But no, I mean, they, they, they did. They fucking persisted. Um, and with this whole Trump care vote, like, I, all I did was, like, criticize Democrats. And suddenly they're just, like, tweeting at me nonstop that you supported Trump. And I'm like, I don't remember doing that, but okay. Um, anyways. Well, you threw but, the election to Trump. I mean. I, I'm really power. influential. I'm so so there was influential. Clear Drew's interference. <laughs> it was Generic you and Susan Sarandon. <laughs> you and Susan Sarandon. Yeah, dude, like we were together. You nobody. We should just run ourselves. Um, but but I, I mean, moving forward, it does seem like um, it does seem like when it comes to our politics in the U.S., I don't know, man. It feels kind of hopeless. Like. I don't know if it's just me perceiving the wrong thing from the internet, but I'm, do you see anything changing in, in in favor of like the more progressive end of the spectrum, even domestically? Because it just feels like we're all totally fucked and like we're just stuck with an endless right wing shift that's gonna keep coming. Uh, these are dark days. I want to. I don't want to leave people on a hopeless note, but. Um... What we saw take place in France or what we're seeing take place in France is incredibly dispiriting. And, of course, there's a campaign to attack the left, the supporters of Mélenchon, um, the sort of left, left principled left wing candidate um, who didn't make uh, the second round of voting. Almost did, though. It was a really impressive showing for a leftist in France. The center left has completely collapsed across Europe. I mean, the Socialist Party in the Netherlands didn't even... It didn't even participate in the elections. Um, the only reason um, Mélenchon lost was because Hamon, the center-left candidate from the like discredited Socialist Party, uh, got 8% of the vote and split the left. And so now the left is being attacked because they won't support Macron, who is this kind of – he's basically a, a right-wing uh, corporatist. In many ways, he's responsible for the rise of Le Pen. And what is being asked – by the pundit class in the West of people in France is that they, um, in order to resist the kind of proto-fascistic politics of Le Pen, um, is that they vote against their economic interests. It's a completely elitist narrative to ask people to vote against their um, economic interests and vote to sell out their union benefits, to sell out their pensions, to just give away the whole public sector of their countries and continue us down this path towards fascism. Uh, and and this, is, this is what the center has given us. The deep state and the center in the U.S. has given us Donald Trump. And we're just being continually asked to hold our nose and vote for them every time. Um, I think people are going to recognize that there has to be a left-wing alternative along the lines of Mélenchon or Jeremy Corbyn in in the UK and uh, to just avoid leaving on a note of hopelessness these figures are out there I don't think Bernie Sanders is adequate isn't because of his uh, just complete willingness to punt on foreign policy mm. but he's provided an apparatus and the kind of uh, movement organizing um, an extremely mobilized young movement um, to bring something else to the fore. I don't exactly know where it's going to come from right now. But there's a, yeah. void that's, there's, a, there's a void there, and someone has to fill it because the, we can't continue to support the center left and the center right to bring us the far right. And they're, they're the ones at fault, not the left. Yeah, that's no, it's true. And I guess to end on a more hopeful note, Max, how do you like you? How do you not get hopeless and depressed? What do you do for to like maintain your sanity? I mean, I'm other still than like, hang out, other than hang out with me because I'm pretty much an upbeat person who makes everyone happy. They make well, you make everyone <laughs> you make everyone sane. <laughs> that, that's like a complete lie, but we can just go with that. But no, really. We call you the you... cooler because you just like, you know, come and cool off tensions. And Yeah, I'm so calm. <laughs> um, anyway, <laughs> I, I don't know. I'm still able to work as a journalist and say what I want. Um, mm -hmm. And the fact that that's possible is encouraging. And uh, you guys have been in the game for a minute, too, and you're you're still kind of... Like you're still standing like Hall and Oates. Um, <laughs> I, I think I think that's just an accomplishment. And you know, sometimes I just get up and I I think you know things are increasingly hopeless. 
Trump is president. Hillary Clinton's leading the resistance. Um, what can I do except be the biggest bastard I can be today and like piss off all the right people um, and, you know, do the work that I've been doing uh, for 15 years? Um, that's and, 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 and report on the things that other people are afraid to report on. I just found there's a huge audience out there of people who are curious and um, they feel hopeless. They want answers. And if we don't provide them with the answers, um, we don't provide them with the facts that they're hungering for that answer so many of the questions they have that aren't being answered by mainstream media and by established politicians, the far right will provide the answers for them. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's kind of the task. So many people are being left behind or being pushed out and being, and, and, and are disengaging. So it's up to us to speak to them instead of to continue to speak in these same, and to continue to organize in these same kind of established institutional left circles that are really increasingly to me, they seem like an echo chamber. All right. Well, thank you so much for coming back on the show. Um, it was really great talking to you and obviously hearing all your analyses and yeah, we're hopefully we can have you back on soon and, and maybe it will be on a better note because like we'll have solved the world's problems and, you know, uh, sufficiently um, did a revolution that actually worked. I don't know. <laughs> Thanks, Mac. Well, our, as Bobby Sands always would say, our time will come. <laughs>